Firstly, let me thank all of you for being here this afternoon. You know what, uh, years ago we used to do this on an annual basis during the holiday season. COVID came, we kind of had to change things around, but I think we're on track uh, to get together every single year from now on. And I enjoy doing it. Now, thank you for coming. I wanted to just update you a little bit as to what's going on in Washington, then I'll stop. You ask me questions, I'll ask you questions. All right? <laughs> um, I think we've made some progress in the last few years. Clearly a lot more has to be done, but we're making some progress. Uh, as you may have noticed here in Burlington, around Vermont, around the country, put a lot of money into rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. And a little bit of time to go over the holes uh, and um, water systems that aren't working quite well, the wastewater plants. We put a record amount of money all over this country, which is putting people to work uh, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure. Uh, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that climate change is very, very real. We are seeing the results of that tragically in our own small state with terrible flooding in parts of this state. It's going on all over the country. We have put more money in the last few years into transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Another area that I know is of concern to everybody in this room is the high cost of prescription drugs. And that's an issue that I've been working on with President Biden and others uh, for a number of years. And here is the good news in terms of a lot of people in this country dealing with diabetes, very serious problem. Uh, historically, we have paid up to 10 times more for insulin than the people in other countries. We have knocked that down for seniors, $35 a month. That's a big deal. I think more important, come January 25, nobody in this room, no senior in this room, nobody on Medicare is going to have to pay more than $2,000 a year out-of-pocket cost for prescription drugs. That's a big deal. And it's a big deal because if you have a number of illnesses and you're taking a whole lot of drugs, those costs can soar. It'll be a maximum of $2,000. Uh, so we're making progress on a number of areas, but much more needs to be done. So let me tell you some of what we're trying to do. We're trying to increase funding very significantly for the Older Americans Act, which is the legislation that funds Meals on Wheels. Anybody here use Meals on Wheels or is a volunteer at Meals on Wheels? Please raise your hand. I just want to thank all of you, all the volunteers and everybody else. They do God's work. They're going out delivering good quality food to people. And sometimes people get very lonely. You know, you get, if you're alone, you're, you're in your own apartment, you don't have the kind of contact you would like to, and they provide that contact. So I'm a big fan of Meals on Wheels. We're going to expand funding for it. If I have anything to say about it, and increase the number of other programs in senior centers around the country. So we're making some progress there. Some other areas. Turns out, turns out that in America, despite the fact that we are the richest country on earth, half of our older workers have nothing in the bank as they approach retirement. It's a lot of stress out there. And then we have about Half of elderly people are living on $30,000 a year or less, and a quarter of our elderly people are trying to get by on $15,000 a year or less. And maybe somebody can explain to me how anybody in America can get by on $15,000 a year or less. I don't know how. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to do another number of things. But one of the easy things, in my view, is to expand Social Security benefits.
Now, how do we do that? Who's going to help me? What's the answer? How do we increase Social Security benefits? All right. Right now, right now, we have an absurd funding system for Social Security. Somebody makes $15 million a year, pays the same amount into Social Security as somebody makes $150,000. Got that? If you lift that cap and you tell the billionaires they're going to have to put more money into Social Security, we can do two things. We can increase Social Security benefits by $2,400 a year and make Social Security solvent for the next 75 years. That's what we can do and that's what we should do. Another related issue. I happen to believe, we can talk about healthcare in a moment, but I happen to believe, and I want you to think about it and tell me what you think. Don't tell me what you, know, you want me to hear. Tell me what your judgment is. I kind of think that our current healthcare system is pretty broken, okay? And Medicare is a strong program. It's not as strong as I would like it to be. What, are the, what is one of the deficiencies in Medicare today? Good, this young man got it right here. Right now on the Medicare, it does not cover dental. Anyone go to the dentist recently? Pretty expensive, right? Outrageously expensive. Doesn't cover hearing aids, doesn't cover vision. So what I want to do is see Medicare expanded to cover dental, vision, and hearing. I think in a country where 60% of working people are living paycheck to paycheck, I want to see the minimum, rate, minimum wage in this country raised to a living wage. Now one of the, you know, I very much appreciate the people of Vermont for having sent me to Washington because often the things that I talk about are not something you're going to see very much on TV or here in the halls of Congress. And one of those issues, that is maybe the most important issue, is the issue of wealth and power in America. What do I mean by that? Now you're not gonna see this on TV today, but today we have more income and wealth inequality than we have ever had in the history of the United States. Got that? You got three people on top who own more wealth than the bottom half of American society. In other words, we are the richest country in the history of the world. Problem is, much of that wealth goes to the hands of a very few people. Amen. And that is an issue that we have got to deal with. So my own view is that at a time when so few have so much and so many have so little, it's time to tax the wealthy and make sure they stop paying their fair share. And I would also say, in terms of healthcare, I don't know how many of you know this, but we are the only major country on earth that does not guarantee healthcare to all people as a human right. Do you all know that? Yep. Anyone? Go 50 miles away from here. A friend of mine's father was in the hospital. He had heavy heart issues in the hospital. Came out and you know what the bill was? Zero. Yet the Canadian managed to provide health care for all of their people without any out of pocket expense at half of what we spent per capita. And the reason for that is that the function of the American healthcare system is not to provide quality health care to all people. That's what it should be, but it's not. Its function is to make huge profits for the insurance companies and drug companies. And that's what we've got to change. I want you all to think about, not only for yourselves, but for your kids and your friends, what would America look like if everybody knew that when you got sick, you can go to any doctor you want, if you end up in the hospital, you go to the hospital, and you don't have to worry about the financial implications of that. 
Some 60,000 Americans die, die every year. You know why? Because they don't go to the hospital or the doctor when they should, because they can't afford the cost. And you talk to doctors in Vermont and all over this country, and they'll tell you people walk into their office much sicker than they should have been. But they walk in and say, I don't have any health insurance, so I have a large deductible, I have a large copayment, I can't afford it. And sometimes they don't make it. Now think about what it would mean to this country. And again, this is not a radical idea. If you turn on TV, you can tell you it's a radical idea. It ain't a radical idea. One form or another exists, not just in Canada, but in the UK, in France, throughout Europe, even poorer countries than us. Think of what it means to know that if you get sick, you don't have to worry about the financial implications. Now, one of the things that we have been talking about recently is canceling medical debt. You know what that means? All right, what it means, God forbid somebody gets sick, they end up in the hospital. They can leave that hospital with $100,000 of debt, $200,000 of debt. Now, how the hell are you going to pay that off if you're a regular person? So you carry that debt. It impacts your credit. So we're trying to get that medical debt canceled, and I'll tell you why. This is unbelievable. One quarter of people who are dealing with cancer, which, as you know, is a very expensive, go to the hospital, it's an expensive treatment. One quarter of people end up going bankrupt or depleting all of their financial resources. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to deal with cancer or some other serious disease, and all that you gotta worry about, your family worries about it, then you gotta worry about the financial implications. That is cruel, that is not acceptable. So the day is gonna come, we gotta keep fighting for it. Not a radical idea. When you are sick, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, whether you're middle class, whatever you are, you should be able to get quality care without worrying about the cost. That is what we should be achieving. Those are, now I want to, I was uh, driving over here, I was just thinking about something. A very interesting thing. There was a poll done by a group called uh, the Pew, P-E-W Research Center or something. Did about a year ago. And this is what they did, they asked the American people a question. Now think about this question, they said, are you today better off than somebody in your position would have been 50 years ago. All right, so the question is, you know, the world has changed a lot, so the simple question, are you better off today, everything being included, than somebody in your position was 50 years ago? And what really surprised me, majority of the people said, no. no, they said no. And people acknowledge a lot of good things that have taken place, you know, medical, you know, certain types of disease, you get treatment now they never could have gotten 50 years ago, and so forth and so on. But that kind of surprised me. And we did something similar in Vermont, and the results were similar. People a little bit worried about the quality of life right now. So let me start off. I'll ask you a question, and you ask me a question. I'll just answer that question. Are you better off, and obviously there are advantages, obviously there are disadvantages, but as a whole, are we better off today than we were Somebody like you, 50 years ago, tell me why, and what you think. Who has up to raise your hand, stand up. We got microphones here? Okay, Beth has a mic. Stand up, don't be shy. Better off or not better off than you were 50 years ago? Somebody's got a view on that, I'm sure. All right, there you go, I see a hand right here. Right. Stand up, you can see. We're not, we're not better off because we have more violence than we ever had 50 years ago. We have more of a prevalence of guns all over the country, and we should have a national ban on assault weapons. Good. Okay. Okay. The gentleman's point of view is there's more violence, more guns, and I agree with you. We should have a ban on assault weapons, but violence is one of the issues where he thinks we're not better off. Uh, let, I see a hand way in the back. Want to move the? I right, bet if you can get out there. Oh, okay. 
You might have to show me what you do. be a better center. The woman said, you know, we're seeing more income and wealth inequality than, than ever before. It impacts all tenor of our society. Do we think, and that's true, I mean, to give just one example. Right now, the CEOs of large corporations make almost 350 times what their workers make. That's far more. 50 years ago, the gap was probably 30, 40 to 1, okay? But how does that impact the tenor? of our society. Are we a society moving toward more and more greed and selfishness and everybody out for themselves? Is that kind of what you're implying? Okay, who wants to, yeah, got it. Give it uh, a... Many... Give your name, give your name, please. Stephen Klein. Stephen. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Bernie supporter from uh, 1981. Yeah. I came here as a medical student, and uh, but I listened to you way before then. I shared the same background as you, Brooklyn, Queens, in an apartment house. I'm a Bernie supporter from the get-go. But I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. There's, you have to address one issue here. First of all, our minds don't work. Are we better off 50 years ago or now? That's not how we live. That's not how we think. We have, yes, we have mass incarceration of young black men and we have overt Jim Crow laws in, you know, in the 50s and the 40s. But we don't think that way, Bernie. Why do you think 71 people voted for the other side against their own interests? Because they're sick and tired of listening to people like you who mean well, who say all the right things, and your heart is right there. And I'm with you, but there's no delivery of services. DNC, wonderful four days. But the real work happened upstairs. You know it as well as I do. The donors are up there eating lobster and shrimp and making policy while we're listening to what we should happen, but it never does. That's why we're pissed. And we're not going to take it anymore. All right, I think what Steve is saying, you may know Steve, but I want to be political. I was the only person who spoke on the floor who addressed that issue. What you're talking about, I think what you're talking about is, and Steve is absolutely right, when we talk about income and wealth inequality, it's not just that, you know, rich people have big homes and jets and islands that they own. They also have a significant impact over the political process. Uh, some of you may be familiar with a terrible Supreme Court decision called Citizens United. And that basically said that billionaires can establish super PACs and put in as much money as they want, hundreds of millions of dollars. So you get one vote. And some billionaire uh, is able to put in zillions of dollars to elect candidates he or she likes or defeat candidates. That is a corrupt political system. So you're looking at somebody actually trying to lead the effort against that. Okay, I see your hand way in the back there. I'm sorry, I kind of snuck into this event. I'm 31. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm oh, okay, throw it around. <laughs> I just wanted to touch on more on the broken healthcare system that yep. we have. Yep. 
I've been a nurse for seven years. I'm currently studying to become a psychiatric nurse practitioner. And um, I feel like over the last seven years, and this was very compounded by the pandemic, we don't care about the healthcare that people are receiving because it's become such a profitable business for the CEOs and all the people in healthcare that they are intentionally understaffing the nurses because nurses are expensive. And I want to give the best care that I can give to you guys. But when I have six or seven patients and I have my call bells going off and I don't have enough help and I'm drowning and I need to ask my coworkers for help, it's you guys who are paying the price. And it's the nurses who are paying the price because we went to school because we want to take good care of people. We don't want to miss a mistake or make a mistake because we're so overloaded with all the care, you know, because we don't have enough help. And this is from greed. This is from the hospitals wanting to understaff nurses and not pay them what they deserve and not staff them appropriately because that takes money out of their pocket. Okay, let me just jump in. Let me thank you with the nurse. The nurses are the backbones of our healthcare system, and I have the pleasure of working with nurses. They do a fantastic. Everything. Your name is. I'm sorry. My name is Courtney. Courtney, what Courtney said uh, is absolutely right. Uh, in many hospitals around the country, uh, nurses, nursing staff. Uh, they simply don't have enough nurses to do the work that they want to do. And I have talked to nurses, saying exactly what Courtney said, with tears in their eyes. In fact, I got involved in a strike in New Brunswick, New Jersey, with nurses. You know why I got involved? They came into my office and they started crying and telling me, it's yeah, they want more money. But it wasn't even money. They were understaffed. They could not do the job they were trained to do that they wanted to do. And for the first time in their lives, they actually went out on strike. And they ended up winning that strike and getting the staffing that they needed to do their jobs. And that's a national issue. Let me tell you something else when we talk about a crazy and dysfunctional healthcare system. Right up here in UVM, which is a good hospital in my view. All right, they do good work. All right, just to give you one example. After COVID, and COVID wrecked havoc with hospitals all over this country. But after havoc, because we don't have enough local nurses, we're not educating our own nurses, they had to bring in traveling nurses. And in a modest sized hospital like UVM, which is big for Vermont, modest sized for nationally, they spent in one year, $125 million on traveling nurses. So what we are trying to do, I'm chairman of the committee of deals with this, is put money into nursing schools so they can greatly expand and educate local nurses. Okay, uh, other questions or comments? I see a gentleman over there. Yeah. Thank you, Ernie. I'll stand up. Your name is? My name is Thomas Locatell. Thomas? And your question, what has changed? In living memory of almost every person in this room, a great deal has changed. Even in knowing our busy lives, we don't notice it until you step back and really take stock. But 50 years ago, when I started my working life, it only required one breadwinner to be able to support a family, have a home, and yeah, a pretty decent lifestyle that most people aspire to. No one's getting rich, but they just want to be comfortable. The wages have stagnated, the tax system has become regressive, and there just doesn't seem to be any way out of that trap that Ronald Reagan led us into. Yeah. <laughs> Let me, uh, Thomas makes an important point. When I was a kid, 200 years ago. George Washington and I were very concerned. But Thomas's point was well taken. 
Back in the day, it took one person in those days, for not good reasons, only men, by the way. Women usually stay home. And that's a positive change that we've seen. But it took one breadwinner to pay the bills. Right now, you go to any working class family you know, middle class family, and you say you got one person working, very, very rare. Almost always two people working in order to pay the bills. And that has an impact on the kids and the whole family structure. People are stressed out, they're really working long and hard hours. Impacts marriages as well. Thomas's point, I think it's a very good one. I see a question right here, woman in the blue. We got a microphone, Ellie's coming. My name is Kate Murray. I trained as an environmentalist in the early 70s, and we are frying our planet. Uh, I'm sorry, let's take that again. We are, we are frying our planet. Frying, heating it up. Yep. Look, you know, um, Dave is right. Uh, I don't have to tell anybody. You know, the planet is warming. We see it in Vermont. We see it in the forest fires, we see it in the drought, we see it in the flooding. We see it in temperatures in India of 125 degrees. And when anyone tells you that climate change is a hoax, I won't tell you who is saying that. But if you hear anybody say that, it is not only incredibly stupid, because the entire scientific community is in agreement that climate change is real, caused by human activity, it's dangerous. I mean, if we, everybody in this room wants to make sure that our kids and future generations are able to enjoy life, and I worry very much if we don't get a handle on climate change, um, it's going to be increasingly difficult. All right, uh, I see a hand. There's a woman over there. Yep. Ma'am? Yep. And by the way, when you get the mic, you can ask, I've been asking well, you questions. You can ask Hi. Yeah. I'm Patty. Patty? I, just, I think it's important to ask, because I have been in this for over 40 years. Before, before the IDs, uh, before uh, doctors, I started as a nurse when doctors were allowed to make their own decisions. And when uh, this changed, where if you don't have the right code, you don't get paid, I just wanted to let everybody know it's really not the hospitals, it's the insurance companies that own our lives. And that somehow needs to be regulated because Medicare, even, if you don't put the right code, then we're going to pay the hospital for a whole stay. That's just. Or even I, part of my past, worked for insurance company, and military families denied their claim because they went to ER with one diagnosis and were released with a second one. And that's that's what I felt was so important to, to tell. All right, thank you, Matthew. All right, and the point there. I mean, the system is broken in so many ways. But one of the ways is we spend hundreds of billions of dollars billing people. So suddenly the people don't get the coverage they thought they were going to get. It costs a fortune to hound people for their bills. Meanwhile, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough dentists, we don't have mental health counselors. Maybe we should put money into those people rather than into bill collectors. Okay. Uh, see hand right here. I, I wanted to say in Canada, in Canada, doctors don't have to pay for their education. And I don't think doctors should pay for their education. That's one of the very expensive things they have to pay for the rest of their lives right. for this expensive. And doctors should get their education for free. Thank you. Now, as chairman of the committee that deals with this stuff, I am very familiar with this issue. I mean, here, this is how crazy it is. You talk about a broken system. Does anybody here have, if you don't have a lot of money, you don't come from a wealthy family, you want to go to medical school, okay? You know what your debt is when you leave medical school in some cases? Who knows? No, higher than that. It could be 400000 500000 okay? Sometimes it's less. 
Now, if you leave school four or $500,000 of debt, you think you're gonna practice primary care in Lindenville, Vermont? You ain't gonna do it. You're gonna become a specialist in some large hospital in some large city. We spend less than half as much as other countries on primary health care. Now, you know why that's dumb? Because if people can't find a doctor when they need that doctor, what happens? They get sicker, and then they end up in the hospital at great expense. So we don't have enough doctors, that's one of the reasons. We need more nurses, we need more doctors, we need more dentists, mental health practitioners. We're trying against a lot of opposition to do that. The idea that in the richest country in the history of the world, you gotta wait months before you can get a doctor's appointment is pretty crazy to my mind. Yes, sir, right here. Uh, Fred Dusbon from Burlington, Colchester. <laughs> Fred Dusbon from Burlington, Colchester. I agree with Bernie on Social Security. Believe me, I believe that. But why don't you and all the rest of the people in Congress introduce legislation so that everybody pays their fair share? Will you do that, introduce legislation? Yes or no? I did it. Oh, uh, we haven't heard it. What's the result? What, what, what happened? The result is the bill is not cut to the floor yet. Can we bring it to the floor? And no, you it? can't, because to answer this gentleman's question, there are people who don't want to bring that to the floor. Look, thank you for asking the question. I have introduced that bill. Hold it. Hold it. I do know a little bit about this, right? The process. It's not so easy. Democrats, that's a long story. Proud to be an independent. Let me just tell you that. All right. All right, the gentleman says, should I bring it? Yeah, I've introduced exactly that bill. It's a good bill, it's a popular bill. We have some support, I can't remember, seven or eight co-sponsors. But a lot of this stuff, when you ask me common sense stuff, why don't we do this? You're right. Well, then it gets back to the joint point this gentleman made you know, a few minutes ago. The people who have the money, you think they want to pay more in taxes? They don't. Do you think the insurance companies want all of you to have quality health care without out-of-pocket expenses? They don't. Do you think the drug companies want us to lower the cost of drug companies? They don't. So the issue that is not talked about, not at the Democratic Convention, not at the Republican Convention, some exceptions, are, is the role that money plays in thwarting the will of the American people. All these things that I'm talking to you about are popular. And have radical ideas. You go out and you say to the American people, it's health care and human right. Overwhelmingly, Republicans, Democrats, independents say yes. Should we expand Medicare? I did a poll on this, national poll. Over 70%, including Republicans, said expand Medicare to cover dental, hearing, and vision. Raise the minimum wage. Enormously popular issues. But you're living in a political system which is very, very heavily dominated by big money interests. That is the struggle that we are engaged in right now. All right, ask me some questions. I've been asking you. Who's got a question for me? Yeah. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for being uh, a senator that I could be proud of. Um, Thanks. Which, which gives me the freedom to float this because it doesn't apply to you. So when you speak of getting money out of politics and trying to clean up the corruption and that sort of thing, the one idea I've never really come across is holding elected officials accountable after they leave office. I would like to see some kind of creative legislation around that because when an elected official doesn't do their job, the most we can do is not vote them in again. And then they walk away, you know, having created all kinds of chaos and havoc, and they've lined their pockets. All right, that's enough for my soapbox. What I wanted to ask you was, do you have an electric vehicle? And the reason why I'm asking is because if we had four times the charging stations as we currently have, we'd still need more. Yeah. We are putting a lot of money. I, no, I do not own a 10-year-old Chevy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which gets good mileage. Um, and you, one of the things that we have done is to put a lot of money into charging 
station. So you're going to see more. I know, I know, it takes time. I know, I know. Uh, but we are, as I mentioned earlier, have put more money into trying to transform our energy system than ever in history. So we're making some progress. More has got to be done. Okay. Uh, no, like, yeah, woman in the pink, yeah. All right, try it without the mic. Come in. Hi, thank you, Senator, for being here. My name is Jennifer Simpson. I'm the Federal Affairs Liaison for the American Physical Therapy Association and spend a lot of my time working on um, access to care and the Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, so over the past 15 or 20 years, the cuts to the providers who are the front line of preventing falls and helping people maintain their mobility have been taking significant cuts. It's 24% um, for physical therapy over the past 20 years, and very similar for other providers. And that's leading to provider shortages, and not just for um, physical therapy, but for primary care and even for some of the less uh, well-paid specialties. Um, I personally, at my clinic, have turned away 500 new patients since April 1st. Yeah. Uh, the hospital was several weeks out for people even having knee replacements or surgeries where they required care, and they have been trying to hire just like all of the other clinics in the area for a year, and even offering 50 or $60 an hour, they're not able to get people to come to Vermont because of what it costs to live here. Question? Yep. What's your question? Oh, the question is, um, you know, what is the... You know, there's the two bills in the House is the HR 2474, which is the Strength in Medicare for Patients and Providers Act, and the Senate bill that Senator Welch just introduced, the Physician Fee Stabilization Act. Um, how is the Health Committee in your office working towards uh, moving those forward to maybe have a permanent fix so that we don't have a therapy cap 30 year adventure? Uh, well, we are working on those. In fact, we passed out of our committee, and I'm proud to say in a bipartisan way, with three Republicans the most significant primary care reform bill in the modern history of America. Now, we've got to get it onto the floor, which is another subject, but we did get out of committee. Okay, a uh, woman right here. Yes, ma'am. Nope, right next to you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Judy Peterson. I've worked in healthcare for about 50 years. I'm retired now. But so uh, we've talked a lot today about healthcare and chronic illness and, you know, getting help for people. But what I'm wondering is what ideas you have about how we keep people healthy. Good. You know, we have, Good. you know. Good. Excellent question. I mean, when we talk about the failures in our system, it's not only how expensive it is, it's not only that we don't have enough doctors and nurses, we do not do as good a job as we should in terms of disease prevention, which is what you're talking about, preventative health care. So we have to invest a lot more in primary health care. I'll tell you what else we have got to do. We are a nation which has an obesity crisis, okay? And a lot of that has to do with the processed food that is being manufactured. We are right now working with the FDA. I mean, where we have made progress, and we should be proud, is in tobacco use. All right, we're making some progress there. And the labeling of tobacco products. Cigarettes kill, all right? That's what I hope most people know. What many parents don't know is that some of these drinks, these fruit, quote unquote fruit drinks that kids eat, are loaded with sugar. Loaded with sugar. So we're working with the FDA now to get strong labeling on food and beverages that have high quantities of sugar, and also trying to deal with the manufacturer, the, the food manufacturers in terms of processed food. Very important issues if we're going to keep this country healthy. Okay, gentlemen, blue shirt. Hi there, my name is uh, Tom Schreiber, and I'm a uh, retired ski instructor. Um, my question to you, Bernie, is um, I recently read that about 5% of Americans are so-called millionaires are in that. And I read a larger percentage 
of millionaires were in our Congress, somewhere around 50 to 55 percent. Um, my question to you is this. What is your stance on term limits? What is your stance not only for Congress, but the Supreme Court, everybody? And yeah, that's basically it. OK, good question. I don't agree with term limits. Why? Why don't I agree with term limits? Does anyone want to help me out here? Does everybody agree with term limits? Institutional knowledge. Yeah, the point is, you're a senator. We term limit you. Next guy comes in could be worse than you. You have term limits, and that is your right to vote people out of office. That's the best term limit. Now, in my view, that's true. The real issue is not term limits. The real issue is money in politics. Why do you think the next guy is going to be better than the, the current person? You know, I hear people, and it's, and it's a similar thing. I gotta, we all have a little bit of a conflict of interest in this. I hear people saying, you know what we need is a younger generation of politicians. Fine, I agree with that. But what is more important than the age? What somebody stands for? What their views are on the issues? All right? So if you have a new senator coming in who wants to cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, because the old guy was term limited, is that a good idea? I don't think so. So I think getting to the root of the problem, it's, it's the power of money and the need for our system forces people to go out and raise all kinds of money from wealthy people. And those wealthy people contribute. You know what you do? You end up doing what they want you to do. What about the Supreme Court? Supreme Court is a whole other issue. That's a different issue. I'll tell you why. If you look at the decisions of the Supreme Court in the last couple of decades, they have been disastrous. And there is evidence right now that you have people on the Supreme Court who are really beholden the big money interest in a way that for members of Congress would be illegal and for the lower courts would be illegal. Now how you deal with that ain't easy within the Constitution. The Constitution provides members of the Supreme Court with lifetime tenure. But you know what? It doesn't provide them having to be on the Supreme Court. It provides them being in the federal court system which means you can rotate people out of the Supreme Court, which I think does make sense. All right, maybe one or two. Uh, I see a woman right over there. Yep, ma'am. Yep. Get with her both. All right. Uh, Doris Sage. So why aren't there incentives for preventive medicine? Why is what? Why aren't there incentives to people for Good. people to practice absolutely. preventive medicine? You're absolutely right. We need more primary care doctors. We need nurses in our schools. We need doctors and nurses literally knocking on doors to pick up problems that people have. The answer is that is not where the money is. The money right now is doing a major operation in a hospital and leaving with a half a million dollar bill. We spend half as much on primary care as the people of other countries. That is crazy. So your point is well taken. We have to invest in primary care, keeping our kids healthy, and in the long run, that's how you save money on healthcare. Yes, the woman right behind you. Hi, my name is Patty. I'm going back to the Supreme Court. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we don't have to limit the Supreme Court to right. nine justices. How do you feel about adding? Ambivalent, justices? in this sense. Uh, Roosevelt tried that in the 1930s. It's called packing the court. So if your guys are outvoted, as the case right now is six to three, you say, hmm, let's see, we've got nine, so we've got to, we're going to add another four. Well, the next guy that comes in is going to add another three, and you're going to have 68 people on the Supreme Court. <laughs> so I, I, that's why I'm not. But I mean, I will say this issue of the Supreme Court is enormously important. Uh, a very, very few people are able to set back an agenda that the American people want, are able to work for wealthy corporate interests, are able to make decisions like overturning Roe v. Wade, one of the worst decisions in modern American history. Etc. All right, let me stop. Now the hands. When we first started, no one raised their hands. 
Now I got hands up all over the place. All right, let me just say this. Um, the country, and I want to thank everybody for your participation in this. Um, it is no secret that our country faces very, very significant problems, and the world faces very significant problems. Uh, the good news is, I know I've given you some bad news, but the good news is, we don't talk about it enough, is that in the U.S. House of Representatives right now, we have elected dozens and dozens of young, progressive members of Congress, often women, often people of color. I was in the House years ago, nothing like it. So you have a whole lot of people, often people coming from the working class, whose parents really struggle, know what it's like to not have the money to pay the rent or to buy the food that they need. And that's a real good change. The other thing that we're seeing, by the way, some of you may have noticed, in Vermont and all over this country, is a growth in the trade union movement. Some of you noticed that? And why is that important? Because if we talk about the power of big money, you need working people to be organized to stand up to that power. And we're seeing that right now. So, uh, there is a lot that's going on. Uh, and I just want to thank all of you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to represent our great state. And I will continue to do my very best. Thank you all very much. <laughs>